You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another episode of Action Design Radio. I am your host, Eric Johnson, and with me, as always, is Zarat Khan. Say hello, Zarat. Hello. That was a very excited hello, because we're very excited for our guest today. Uh, we are excited to have Rory Sutherland calling in from uh, all the way over in the UK. Uh, we're thankful for him spending uh, it's Friday night his time. We're very thankful he's spending his Friday evening with us. So thanks a ton for joining us, Rory. Absolute pleasure. Joy to be here. So uh, I think we get started. Do you want to do kind of a quick introduction to yourself? Um, I'm sure for a lot of our listeners, you probably don't need a, a big introduction, but uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in behavioral science and kind of what you're, what you're working on now. Uh, well, first thing to say is I'm completely unqualified in the area in that uh, um, I suppose the, the more positive way of saying that is self-taught. In accepted as far as 30 years in advertising and direct marketing kind of makes you a behavioral scientist, whether you like it or not. I... Um, I started about 30 years ago at a branch of Ogilvy, then called Ogilvy and Mather Direct, which was the direct marketing arm. And very quickly learned through, for those of you who don't know what direct marketing is, it's the form of advertising less common then than now, where you have measurable results. Now, what would be a click rate today was then a called a response rate and it was either off the page advertising uh, or it was direct mail advertising typically uh, telemarketing was included but the thing that distinguished it was you had a form of measurement and very very quickly you realized that very very small things would have very large effects for example very quickly you also realized that economics as a reliable guide on its own uh, certainly its predictive value in terms of human behavior was really pretty bad. And it always fascinated me that as far as I could see at the time from 1988, when I started um, until about, I guess, 2005, six, seven, when I discovered behavioral science and behavioral economics, it always struck me as very strange that the very, very obvious discrepancies which were revealed by not only experiments with college students in the case of direct marketing, but which were revealed by off-the-page selling in advertising, where, for example, the most effective way to sell something might be to say that there were very few of them left. There was scarcity bias, as we now call it, okay? Nearly every uh, direct mail letter you sent had to say, reply within 14 days. Uh, now, the reason we put reply within 14 days was not because if you replied within 30 days, we'd refuse to sell the product. We'd obviously sell the product and sell the product if you replied six years later, assuming the pricing was the same. No, the reason it said reply within 14 days is we simply found that saying reply within 14 days massively increased the number of people who replied. And it always struck me as weird that this wasn't an area of study until I suppose I started reading in various economics books and also economics blogs, blogs like Marginal Revolution by Tyler Cowan and so forth, that there was now this discipline, which I always thought was, was long overdue, uh, that studied precisely this. And um, my view is that it's of enormous value, actually, to marketers and advertisers, simply because the it's not, I mean, there's a wonderful comment, I think, by Amos Tversky that what he said, Amos Tversky said, what he and Daniel Kahneman did and what they explored was effectively things that advertising executives and car salesmen already knew, but they codified them in a kind of recognizable academic form. And I think that's why it's particularly valuable and interesting because most people, I think, in advertising, most people in sales, most people with a natural instinct for salesmanship. The only way I can express it is to say they know a lot more than they know they know in that there's a great deal of tacit knowledge in any experienced salesman. Fantastic case in point. Uh, one of the worldwide creative directors of Ogilvy, a man called Neil French, started his life as an encyclopedia salesman. And he would be selling children's encyclopedias, uh, typically to parents. 
Um, and it would be things like, I suppose, Children's Britannica. I don't know if you remember this. It was a 1970s children's version of Encyclopedia Britannica. And you'd sell them typically on a kind of rolling subscription. And what he always did is he'd go out in the rain. He'd find a house which obviously had children of the right age, identified by things like bicycles outside. And he'd let himself get hopelessly soaked. And he was this bedraggled figure ringing on the doorbell. And his first comment was basically to ask for a favour. It was, I couldn't come in, could I? Uh, I'm absolutely soaked out there. And the first thing you do is cadge a cigarette. Now, I suppose when you think about it, you'd think, wouldn't you, that maybe an act of generosity would be the best thing to do, to give someone something free in the hope they'd reciprocate. He did the opposite, which is playing on consistency bias, which is if he could get them to perform one or two small acts of generosity, I come in and warm up, warm, warm up by the fire and here's a cigarette. Bear in mind, this was 1970s. Asking for a cigarette now would be a weirder and, to be honest, less successful request. Yeah. Um, he found that if you could get people to perform two or three small acts of generosity towards you, the likelihood that when it came to the bigger ask, which was, wouldn't your kids be better at school if they had a really good set of encyclopedias, the odds were vastly improved. Now, the interesting thing about that is he knew it or else he knew it instinctively or else he discovered it through a kind of Darwinian experimentation as a salesman. And lots of us and lots of people in this field know a lot of this stuff but they never codified it in a way that you could spot common patterns. Arguably, I think Robert Cialdini, who kind of embedded himself in sales forces and investigated what the common patterns of behavior were, the kind of what the universals were. I think he was, in many ways, the founding father of modern behavioral economics. He was the first person to investigate what actually caused people to be persuaded. And... I, I, I say the founder of modern behavioral economics for a very good reason. I think the founder of behavioral economics uh, is probably Adam Smith, if you've read both of his books. Uh, in many ways, by the way, the Austrian school uh, of economists were way ahead of the game here. I and mean, they had a discipline called praxeology, which is essentially behavioral economics by another name. Um, and they believed that economics was the study of praxeology under conditions of scarcity. And they believed, rightly as I believe, that uh, economics as a discipline had to be subordinate to psychology to have any validity. So they were very much against this modern economic practice of trying to model it on, phys on Newtonian physics. And, but I think uh, that business where th there was an enormous amount of knowledge there, but no one had actually hoovered it up and done the kind of Linnaeus job in categorizing it all. And I think Cialdini was the first guy to do this, followed by, obviously, other famous people in the field. Yeah, I, I love the way you kind of described that, because I think that describes a lot of how, in a lot of what we talk about in the podcast is, like, some people are in academics, some people are in industry, and there's always an interesting, like, way, uh, there's always different ways that those overlap, and I always think there's some debate in how they should overlap, but, like, I love that example because... Like, to me, that's where it's always seen where it makes sense is a lot of people in industry do things intuitively because it just works. And they're not really necessarily measuring it in the most scientific way possible, but they find these ways. Like the car salesman, for example, can say, these are the things you do to sell a car, but he can't explain why and he can't really explain to other people or spread that knowledge in a good way. Um, and actually, so one thing I'll always defend economics for is, for all its faults, economics has created a great vocabulary. I mean, you know, phrases like diminishing marginal returns and opportunity cost are, even if you don't believe in economics very much, they're hugely useful um, little thought bombs yeah. encapsulated in a few words. So I'll always defend it for that. The academic business distinction is one that really interests me because, funnily enough, my brother's an academic. Um, my Quite a lot of my family are academics. And if anything, I'm a bit of an anomaly in going to business. I think there, there are often there's a view that academia is incredibly pure because it's unsullied by commercial considerations. Uh, and academics feel terribly smug about this. The only point I'd make is that when the currency isn't money, the currency becomes reputation. And reputation is kind of a zero-sum game. In other words, your reputation only rises at the price of someone else's falling. And as a result, academia is often characterized by utterly bizarre feuds between practitioners 
who, to be honest, in the private sector, would probably have got together and started a business. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, so some of these bizarre kind of hair-splitting feuds that repeatedly, I think, baffle people who observe, uh, well, actually, the field of behavioral economics, the hur- heuristics and biases debate, for example, um, uh, you know, to people outside it is often seems to be a completely bemusing debate. I mean, even Professor John Kay can't really understand it. Um, the other thing I think about business, which we mustn't forget, is that I think a mistake that's often made by people in academia, which is a form of physics envy, is the idea that you have to come up with a right answer. Now, that presupposes the idea that there's only one. And one of the great virtues of capitalism is that it can come up with more more than one right answer to a single question. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, depending on context, depending on mood, depending on personality, etc., it's rather like one of those questions that always fascinates me is, how should I get to the airport? You know, and... Like all things, there isn't a single right answer because the best way of getting to the airport in order to catch a flight will depend on a whole bunch of variables, which are in many cases completely uh, incommensurable and incomparable. Like, what's the weather like? How long are you going for, for example? Now, why does it matter how long you're going for? Because if you're going for two weeks, you're going to have a lot of luggage. So public transport may be a bit of a pain. But also, if you're going for two weeks, the relative cost of car parking relative to a taxi becomes a lot higher. Then you have to factor in things like what, what you know, what's the weather like? Um, you have to factor in what time of day you're actually traveling to the airport. Now, all of those things, in a sense, when there's more than one right answer, that's, I think, what capitalism does rather well, which is essentially, provided there's a significant number of people who want something, it will deliver it. You know, that's the great disadvantage of a command economy, in a sense, in that a command economy was having to decide what kind of bread is right for people. And that is not, a, unlike, for example, you know, certain problems in physics, unlike our high school maths, that isn't a question with the right answer where you put a big tick by it and where every other answer is wrong. I mean... In economics, I lost faith in economics completely when I read a serious piece by an economist writing, I think, in The Economist sometime around the the 1980s or early 90s, where he was effectively writing the whole piece on how inefficient the German brewing industry was compared to the American brewing industry. Okay. And he was pointing out, you know, the, co- the logistical cost of distribution and the cost of manufacture was much, much lower in the United States, which had centralized brewing basically in Milwaukee with enormous economies of scale. OK, now, yeah. I was reading this. And St. Louis, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I said, but hold on a second. American beer is now probably as good as anywhere else in the world. Why is that? It's not because of economists, yeah. <laughs> it's hipsters, okay? Yeah. You don't want economists if you're in a brewing industry. You want hipsters. You want people who are literally going to produce like six gallons of this stuff every year and are going, going to do it with insane loving care. So we have, to be honest, absolutely honestly, huge amounts of gratuitous choice and variety, which probably add to our enjoyment of the beer simply because we enjoy placebo choice and the freedom to bullshit when there are lots of different types of beer. I mean, how did you have a beer conversation in America in the 1970s? I like Miller. I prefer Budweiser. That was the debate, um, basically. That, that's <laughs> yeah. basically it, you know. And likewise, you know, American cheese was wonderfully efficient, centralized in Wisconsin, but there were two kinds. There was the yellow one and the red one, right? You know, and and, and so... When I read this paper, and I was going, but hold on, at what point is he going to admit that kind of in 1980, German beer was a hell of a lot better than American beer? And he never got to that point because he viewed it as essentially an exercise in producing liquid of a certain alcoholic strength and distributing it. Now, to be honest, I think we derive, if you think about wine, I think we derive a large amount of our pleasure from wine comes from the insane amount of variety, which gives us the license to bullshit. It gives us the license to practice what Freud called the narcissism of small differences. You know, we can signal our own sensitivity by claiming that, um, you know, of the three double IPAs we tried that evening, we found the second one a bit too hoppy. 
you know. Now, to be absolutely honest, yeah, there's a huge amount of bullshit in this. But if the human has largely evolved in order to enjoy bullshitting, who's to say it's a less valid form of pleasure than that derived from alcohol, which is also unnecessary when you think about it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, find, I find this very interesting because it seems obvious to me that economics, which doesn't factor in what is specifically human about human perception and, and the way that humans process information. Now, this, this is a wider question which worries me a bit because what humans react to is not objective reality, OK? Humans don't go... Uh, so even something as numerically simple as price or time is not something that humans perceive remotely, linearly, nor objectively. I mean, you can see that in phrases like time flies when you're having fun, or, for example, it was the longest half hour of my life. You know, people say, you know, it was, you know a bad experience. They say, basically, it was the longest hour of my life. Now, once you accept that, what I think a lot of people are trying to do in trying to scientize human behavior and this is what AI might get badly wrong, is you'll have a lot of data on the objective world and you'll have a lot of data on how humans behave in response. But if you're trying to compare the, the one to the other without understanding the mapping of, you know, essentially I suppose it goes something like the objective reality, how we perceive it, the context in which we perceive it, the meaning we attach to it, the emotion we derive from the meaning, and the behavior driven by the emotion. It's something like that. You know, it's some sort of seven-stage mapping. Now, if all you're trying to do is to say, let's look for effectively um, similarities between objective state A and behavior B, right, and you don't understand the effect that changing the context could have, then you're going to come up with, A, only solutions which involve changing objective reality, which is the most expensive thing to do. So you'll never rescue a failing product by telling a new story about it, OK? I mean, let's take, OK, great advertising case, Old Spice, absolute dying brand. You put an insanely cool guy uh, as the face of the brand with incredibly brilliant, whimsical and funny advertising. Suddenly, something goes from being dead in the water to actually achingly cool because someone's told a different story about it. Now, it strikes me that we will totally fail to understand this because what we'll end up doing is saying we need to make trains faster for example. Now, if you if you look simply at objective price information and you compared it to behavior and you did that before Starbucks existed, you would have a billion data points that told you that people effectively won't pay more than $2.20 for a cup of coffee in a cafe. But if you change the context where, A, you've got a bit of a you know, a little bit of a kind of status brand. But more important, I think you've got a cafe which claims to be and is predominantly all about coffee. So that rather than selling coffee as a sideline, it sells coffee as the main attraction. What we're prepared to pay under those circumstances changes. And it always strikes me as a fundamental flaw of, um, uh, of, of some behavioral science experiments where people go, but they don't replicate. And I go, well, I wouldn't expect them to replicate. The whole point of behavioral science is context matters, okay? And if you change the context, yeah. you can change the behavior every bit as much as you can change behavior by changing what reality is. And when someone said the jam experiment doesn't replicate, doesn't always replicate, well, what a surprise, okay? So that paradox of choice question. Now, let, let's, let's give you two extreme examples, okay? You're in a large supermarket and you're in a hurry and you're not even that sure that you want to buy any jam, okay? Now, under those conditions, it might be that you're much more likely to buy jam if your choice is constrained and reasonably small, right? At the other extreme, if you've just driven 30 miles to visit an out-of-town superstore called World of Jam, right, it's highly unlikely you're going to get into World of Jam and go, oh, Jesus, there's just too much choice. How could I possibly cope? <laughs> right, darling, we're going home. Okay? So depending on the sort of circumstances and the path dependency and all those other things, how on earth would we have evolved if we responded to the same thing in the same way, regardless of context? Apart from anything else, we've become absurdly predictable. And in evolutionary terms, being predictable is a pretty much a shortcut to, to a funeral. <laughs> right? Okay. I mean, you become hackable if you think about it. 
You're easy you know, to predict, yeah. You're easy to predict, yeah. Um, and so, so you know, one of the things is I, I was I jokingly wrote an article say, saying it's not a replication crisis; it's a replication opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I'm, in a sense, I sincerely believe that. I also think there are some failings which I'm not clever enough to understand, but I think there are failings statistically in the whole question of kind of p values in the first place. Yeah, never mind p hacking. I think. The idea that you have the same burden of proof for something, regardless of the um, possible upside and downside consequences, seems to me ridiculous. So, for example, we painted, you know, um, rather lovely murals on shop shutters and all the evidence suggested they seem to reduce crime. Now, my argument to that is, is this absolutely robust evidence? No, it probably wouldn't hold up in a kind of academic paper. Uh, all the anecdotal evidence and all the statistical evidence we had suggested that at the very least crime had gone down more than you would have expected. OK, now, my other defense of it is simply, look, what's the worst that can happen? It's highly unlikely that painting attractive images of children on shop shutters is going to increase crime. It doesn't cost very much. It makes the environment la largely more colourful and more pleasant, even if in some parallel universe it had no effect on crime. So let's just treat that as good enough. Well, the interesting thing to me about that is that, and it came up a number of times in your book, and I, which I, I really liked a lot because I think sometimes people get so focused on one specific metric or one specific goal, like going yeah. back to the beer example, right? Like you're like, okay, how much can we produce and how can, how quickly can we get it to people? Speak And speaking of which, I'm actually recording this from about two blocks away from Anheuser-Busch, which is where I live in St. Louis. Oh my goodness, uh, yeah. So I don't let, don't I let them hear this, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> don't let them my house for any, uh, you know, <laughs> traders. Well, um, they're, they're already buying all the smaller breweries anyway, so they know what this right, is. That's yeah. true. You know, so, so, you know, they focus so much on well, how can we make this, you know, as much as we can, as quickly as we can and distribute it to as many people as we can, you sort of lose sight of like, <clears throat> well, but but is this like enjoyable? Like, is this good in the first place? And is that, are those exclusively the right metrics to look at, right? To some extent, you kind of want to consider those, but, you know, to your to your point, to your example with the, the shop shutters, like, okay, yeah, we, we, we think that this is having an effect. Maybe we can't say sort of like, you know, enough to write an academic, academic paper about it or get it in a journal, but... Um, but also we just think that this is enjoyable. And that was one of the things that I liked a lot about your book is that you also sort of seem to insert this, this kind of, uh, I mean, metric isn't the right word, but this sort of thing that you're kind of tracking, like the example that you have, which I loved about, um, GPS, right. And it was, you know, it's obviously it's designed and built by engineers. And so they're like, well, how should we make it work? Well, fastest make it be the fastest most efficient route yeah and you know you make this excellent point of like well not necessarily, that's not always the best thing you might want an enjoyable route that takes you past nice scenery you might want something that's consistent you know over time low variance route is uh, likewise if you're catching a plane you want a low variance route if you're going to visit your mother-in-law you might want lots of unexpected traffic jams that give you an excuse <laughs> for turning up late you know i mean there are all sorts of motivations we might have and the engineer presumes the most rational and numerically available one. Uh, there's, you know, there's a good dose of quantification bias. Uh, there's an extraordinary case, actually, which I always remark upon about how in the appearance of objectivity often disguises actually a very high degree of assumption. So Google Maps and Google Navigation, in which, if you think about it, is created by Californians, right? Now, in California, basically... Anything within 300 miles, if you've got a car, you drive, right? Now, that's okay in California. So Google has this weird bifurcation in navigation where you either choose car, and it tells you how to get there by car, or you choose public transport, at which point it assumes you don't have a car, and it tells you how to get a bus to the nearest railway station. Now, maybe in California, this isn't that dumb a thing to do, because it probably reflects realistic reality. If you live as I do on the outskirts of London, there is only one sane way to get to central London, which is you take your car, because there aren't enough buses, you take your car to the railway station and you board a train. And it's both faster and easier than any other alternative. Being Californian, Google can't understand this combination. Why would anybody get out of their car to board a train? 
Okay, this seems completely incomprehensible to a to someone who's designing this thing in Palo Alto or wherever. And so if I ask, how do I get to work of Google, it will give me two routes, one of which is exclusively using mass transportation, which takes about two and a half hours because the bus to the railway station doesn't come for another 45 minutes. OK, the other one involves driving all the way, in which case the last hour would be spent stuck on traffic, stuck in traffic. And so it's that little assumption that you either are doing one or the other leads to an entirely ridiculous recommendation. And I think, I mean, I think that happens more and more, which is that the you know, algorithms give the appearance of being you know, wonderfully objective, but actually enshrined in them are all the assumptions and prejudices of the designer. Um, and, I, and by the way, I think it's dangerous for markets because one of the great things about markets being messy is that if you take the housing market 30 years ago, OK, now, the way you discovered a house was for sale 30 years ago might have involved seeing an advertisement in the newspaper, seeing an advertisement in a magazine if it was high end property. You might have looked in the Sunday Times. You might have looked in a local paper. Uh, you might have um, uh, gone to an estate agent in the area you're interested in and asked them what they what they got. You might have walked past an estate agent's window. You might have been driving along, seen a really great house and seen for sale outside. OK, now, as a result, lots of people discovered available housing through a method which was messy and it was individually messy, but it was collectively very variegated. Right. Now, what happens is everybody goes to one of two websites, which have a kind of monopoly power. Then they put in a postcode and they put in a price and then they search high, low or low high up to that price band or down from that price band. What we found apparently in the UK is because of this uniformity of choice architecture, which people are presented with, you can't really sell a house for £875,000. And the reason is that at that price point, there are £50,000 increments in the search range. And people searching high, low or low, high won't find a house in the middle of the price band nearly so easily as they'll find one at the edge. So as a result, we don't have a price demand curve for housing. We have a price demand ziggurat. It's like a barbell. You, yeah, <laughs> It's kind of like a barbell where you have to price your house to, in a sense, exploit the algorithm. Now, you know, in a messier world, what I always said is markets, markets were intelligent precisely because people were stupid. OK, so there are people, to be honest, this might include me, OK, who pay a thousand. We won't tell anyone. Car. <laughs> OK, you know, we, we, when we bought a car, we just really loved piping on the leather seats. OK, or, you know, go back another 20 years. White wall tires might have been a deal breaker for a chunk of people. Right. OK, now. <laughs> It would be a crazy market if everybody decided on a car by how cool the tyres were, right? But the fact that actually some people use crazy metrics to decide means that actually things that other people like quite a lot, like white wall tyres and leather piping on the seats, do get factored in to the overall design of a car. Now, if you if everybody goes to an algorithm and they search for cars according to objective metrics, what will happen is that the uniformity of the choice process will actually make markets stupider rather than more intelligent. The individual standalone decision might be more intelligent, but the collective ability of information of markets to aggregate information from a whole variety of different preferences and different choice architectures may actually be lost and we may find ourselves in this kind of soviet style um uh, market economy where it's like too uh, you know, efficient in other words, there's very, we're too efficient and there's very little variety and in other words the metric starts distorting the the metric or the design of the choice architecture starts distorting the kind of things that get made so yeah, I well, I think this is a really good example because uh, you know one thing I wanted. To, I'm not even sure if we've mentioned the book specifically by name, but the book is called Alchemy, and it came out uh, earlier this year, right? And this kind of the theme of the you know the broader theme of the book is that we value we're we're way overvaluing logic in the world, and we're making too many decisions based on logic when the world is sort of inherently illogical. Um, and I think. You know, that's an example of markets getting too efficient. I think that I love the beer example, actually, because I think that's almost a perfect example in that in a truly efficient, like people want beer because they want to get drunk. 
So like, mm. let's just get make it really easy to make a choice, and let's just make have a few options. Where in reality, there's so many other factors there. It's like you know, I liked the jam store example because I think of that when I go to buy beer. If I walk into a store and they have a very small beer selection, I'm like pissed because like I actually want to like a you, lot of you, choices. You want the paradox of choice. I want the paradox way. of choice because like it's not just the beer. It's like <laughs> not I want to in the British sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different fist. Um, <laughs> but well, eventually you get there. But yeah. Um, We're starting to use use it to mean both, which is oh, doubly wow. confusing. That's confusing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but in the beer sense, it's like, you know, uh, if I'm going to a party, I want to bring an interesting beer to the party. Um, and I want to either be one I know is really good, but a lot of people don't know of, or I want to get something brand new. So like somebody you can try something new. There's so many other purposes to that. Uh, and this to is, your point, this like is that, the... that's very inefficient, really. But like that's what makes us happier and more enjoyable, you know? I mean, this is one of the things which is it's very, very easy because there's always an official reason why we buy things and a deeper reason uh, or deeper reasons. And one of the things I was very flattered to get quoted in Nassim Taleb's book um, is that it's very, very easy to say the purpose of a, of a dishwasher is to wash your dishes. Uh, because that seems the logical explanation for what it's for. And my argument is actually the principal value to having a dishwasher is that it gives you a place to put dirty crockery out of sight. Absolutely. I, I, I had like no bag, I had yeah. no dishwasher for like five or six years when I finally got one. That was by far the best thing was like there's someone to put dirty dishes. Because the washing up itself isn't that gru you know, it isn't that grueling. What yeah. is totally grotesque is having to sit around with a pile of kind of you know uh, decomposing food on plate, <laughs> yeah. in, you know in sight of where you're sitting and the similar one was the swimming pool where i said the principal benefit actually a swimming pool is really interesting because we've just had this massive spell of hot weather in the uk which uh it's about 101 fahrenheit in london which is pretty much unprecedented yesterday now i'm not extreme by american standards i get that it's hot for london added, I will say, in a personal example, I studied abroad in London in college, and there was a similar heat wave, and I learned very quickly that there's not much air conditioning in London, because it's not typically needed. So it's even worse when it's actually no. really hot. So, I mean, there's a weird thing that actually, in a heat wave, you're better off in Greece than you are in France, because the French have a huge reluctance to install air conditioning, uh, whereas the Greeks basically realize it's, it's essential. But there's also the problem that London's quite humid. Um, so, it, uh, funnily enough, I'm totally unbothered when I'm in Phoenix in, you know, 105 degrees. It's so I wander dry. around perfectly happily. It's so dry. Um, and that's actually a good example of, like, metrics being different in context, too. It's like 105 degrees is very different in Phoenix than it is in London. It is. Yeah, I don't know. And actually, of course, um, actually, that goes back to a very interesting scientific uh, debate, which is in the early days of measuring temperature... You know that, of course, American weather forecasts often have, it says 103 degrees, and then underneath it says, feels like 106 degrees. And that's, of course, the difference between physics and psychophysics, which is what, what it actually is and what we perceive. Feels like, you know. And I think those two little words, feels like, when initially they decided to make a scientific measure of temperature, there was a very large kickback from a group of people who said you can't have a measure of temperature which is detached from perception because a breeze will affect how hot it feels now one of my contentions is that a swimming pool reduces your perceived temperature because by dint of sitting by a swimming pool you feel that the heat is escapable by jumping into the pool and therefore the oppressive nature of extreme heat is reduced. Secondly, with a swimming pool, it gives you a license to walk around your garden in a bathing costume without feeling like an idiot, right? If you don't own a swimming pool and you walk around your garden in a pair of bathing trunks, you basically feel like a bit of a git. <laughs> Whereas weirdly, just owning a swimming pool, even if you never use it, gives you a license to do this kind of thing. <laughs> to walk so, around half naked or whatever you want, yeah. So product, product, it's very easy to say, yes, okay, the purpose of product X is Y. And actually what you find is that there's nearly always a lot more going on. Once you accept the perceptual qualities and the knock-on qualities, uh, and of course, signaling qualities. I mean, you know, how many people bought a pair of shoes in order to protect their feet in the last week? A pretty small minority, really. It's all about something else. Yeah, I, um, it's funny you use the weather as an example because I, I grew up in Florida and now living in the Midwest, it's the temperatures often are kind of similar, but here it's obviously miserable. Whereas in Florida, it's like it's, it's beach weather. You know, you go to the beach and it's great. Um, for exactly you have somewhere to go. Yeah, as you said for a pool, you know. So as you are 
trying to introduce these types of ideas to your clients, do you find that, that those are well received? Is it is it easier because you're an ad agency and you're kind of expecting or looking for ideas that are kind of out of the box or seem so, somewhat counterintuitive? Well, it's never, it's never easy for two reasons, one of which nobody has a budget for solving problems they didn't realize they had. Okay, <laughs> That's the one curse of running this Common business. Paradox, yeah. it's, it's, it's really quite easy to add value. I mean, I, I say that not smugly, simply by saying, simply by going into an organization and saying, what are the overriding logical assumptions of this organization, which have survived for years because they are plausible and seemingly rational? And which of those assumptions might be wrong? OK, literally, you basically go in and I call this the science of knowing what economists are wrong about. You basically go and say, OK, what would an economist assume here? OK, what would someone who is most interested in appearing rational to his fellow employees? What would he recommend? Now, of all those things, a proportion of them will be wrong assumptions. They've survived simply because, of, you know, the assumption that we, we buy toothpaste to prevent uh, for purposes of dental hygiene. It's really about breath freshening. Mm -hmm. If you look at when people clean their teeth and the fact that toothpaste is mostly mint flavoured, uh, you realise that actually this is not really driven by the thing we claim it's driven by. Then you also get, I think, this problem, which I think we really have to debate, which is we were talking back about this thing, which is that you have to have there's a kind of instrumentalism, which I can only describe as a model of the economy and a model of markets and a model of business, which is derived from our understanding of machines. And in a machine, everything is there to serve one purpose, really. What's the carburetor for? It does this. OK, now, in an evolved or complex system. You know, we use our mouth to speak, we use it to breathe through, and we use it to eat, okay? It's a kind of multi-purpose device. Um, there's much more going on. And one of the things that bothers me about this very, very instrumentalist, mechanical, Newtonian model of the world is that what you'd have to do, let's say some, let's take something very close to my heart, which is advertising, okay? You'd have to say, okay, we have a business strategy. The reason we are advertising is to achieve this. We will advertise with the sole purpose of obtaining that one thing, whatever it may be, and we will measure and evaluate the success of our advertising exclusively by the extent to which it moves the thing it's intended to move. Right? Okay. So that's the instrumentalist view. Now, here's my opposite view. Um, interestingly, I shared it with Keith Weed, who's the marketing director of Unilever, and he kind of said, why did nobody tell me this before? Okay. Which is... Nassim Taleb would, would phrase this much better than I could, but let me put it like this. If you asked a teenager, why do you go out on Saturday night? He'd answer, basically, because I might get lucky. Now, the luck could be sexual. It could be he meets a new mate. He has a great time. There's fantastic crack, you know, uh, uh, by which I mean, sorry, the Irish sense of the word crack. <laughs> Just to be clear on that. <laughs> that, that. Rehearse, yeah. OK, but, OK. You know, then, you know th th he has a great laugh with his friend. He doesn't really know. OK, what he does know is that he might get lucky if he goes out. He won't get lucky if he stays home. If he stays home, the odds of the girl of his dreams suddenly knocking on his door and going, where have you been all my life, is basically nil. And so going out, or to use advertising, fame, asymmetrically exposes you to the upside of positive good fortune. In other words, the more famous you are, stroke, the more you go out on a Saturday night, the more you're exposed to happy accidents, which overwhelmingly tend to be positive, not negative, by which I mean they're new opportunities, they're new connections, they're new discoveries, right? If you're a famous company, the value of advertising, the value of your fame will, it will actually manifest itself not in the thing you've chosen to measure. In fact, that may not even be improved at all. But A, your chief executive will get his phone calls returned. OK, B, highly talented people will come and try and work for you. Three, people will come to you with really interesting ideas because they've heard of you and you're the only person they've heard of who might understand what it is they've got to offer. Um, uh, uh, a TV company will ring you when it wants to interview somebody about this subject and you'll get a ton of free publicity. 
And it occurred to me that there's a perfectly good justification for advertising, which doesn't involve this instrumental approach, which is we decided in advance that the purpose of advertising was to achieve this thing which we foresee and predict will be important to our fortunes. I, the kind of thing you do in a world of complete certainty and predictability. There's a perfectly valid justification for advertising, which is just to say that fame carries a much bigger upside than it does a downside. The more famous you are, your odds of being lucky in some way as yet unspecified is inordinately increased over your chance of getting lucky if you choose to remain obscure and, um, uh, and secretive. And that's a perfectly valid justification, which says we don't know how we're going to get lucky. We don't know how it's going to work, but we know that luck exists and our opportunity to benefit from it is inordinately dependent on the number of people who mentally think of us when a particular thing comes, you know, comes to mind. And that's good enough, in my view. You know, the fact that it's not quantifiable, the fact that it's not precise and the fact that it doesn't pretend to the ability to predict the future doesn't make it actually an invalid thing to do. And indeed, if you measure your advertising only by its success at uh, obtaining those results which you set out to obtain in the first place, you might be undervaluing your advertising by a factor of 10. And that's what I mean by the instrumentalist problem, which is you go, no, 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 your mouth, it's got to be about one thing. Is your mouth for breathing through? Is it for speaking? <laughs> is it for sexual purposes? Is it for eating? Because you've got to decide. Okay, well... In reality, no, you don't. Right? Yeah, and um, uh, and so I think there's a, you know there's a fundamental mistake, which is the urge to make things scientific. Unfortunately, what people think when they think I must be scientific is they don't think kind of probabilistically. They think in terms of high school maths questions where there was a single right answer and the opposite to the right answer was wrong. And my contention is one of the miracles of capitalism is actually that quite often in reality, the opposite of a good idea is actually another good idea. And capitalism can actually find both of them. Yep. By the way, by the way, I'm not dissing cheap beer produced highly efficiently. OK, you know, it has its uses. You know, right? okay? you know let's face it. It's not as if Anheuser-Busch is dying anytime soon. A lot of people, that's what they want. But equally... Um, there's a whole, op literally, the opposite of Anheuser Busch, which is, uh, you know, strange people in microbreweries producing weird beers in minute quantities. That's a good idea too. Yeah, it's like the the inefficiencies create choice that, mm. like, to satisfy all of those different uh, options. Um, yeah, and I liked your example of like the getting lucky because um, you think of it from a business perspective. It's like how do you increase your opportunities and say like here's a bunch of things that might produce results. How do we do a lot of those? I think of that too is like so I used to live in New York and like I remember like thinking a lot of it. I was like it makes no economic sense to live here. It's very expensive. Like no. the quality of life is very low. It's probably similar in like London. It's like it's incredibly expensive. Your apartments are really crappy. You need roommates until you're like forty, basically. Like there's all these things that like don't make sense. But like <laughs> no. so like well, why actually, do people it's put even up... more extreme. It's even more extreme in the US where yeah. if you're prepared not to live in New York and you can have two thirds of a New York salary, you live in a sodding palace, you guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. seriously. I remember going around the Midwest, it was somewhere like I think it was Waukesha, Wisconsin, uh, somewhere like that. And it was people who worked for the phone company. Now, what always fascinated me was their daughter had left, you know, uh, you know, a kind of nice town 50 miles north of Milwaukee. And she'd moved to New York and was living in like a one and a half room apartment and considered herself hugely successful. Whereas the dad who worked for the phone company actually had a three car garage with three sodding Corvettes in it and a five-bedroom house with an acre of grounds. And I'm going, the weird thing is, you think you're the successful one. Now, in yeah. all objective terms, you're basically deranged, except in terms of opportunity. Yeah. Like, which is, yeah, your yeah. chances of getting lucky in London are probably multiplied by about 10. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah it's like, you know, I'm you gonna feel like, the even though you're... And use that in all of my recruiting for uh, bringing people to St. Louis to work Yeah, there we go. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, it's there's like... an interesting thing if you think about it. This fascinates me because, uh, in in a way, um, it used to be the case that a city was a better place to earn money, but in fairness, it was also a better place to spend it. 
And my guess would be in St. Louis, you have quite enough hipsterism, interesting cafes, microbreweries. Basically, you've got enough culture and what you might call face to face entertainment to keep me interested. OK, with the additional benefit that the best bookshop in the world, which used to be in New York or London, is now online. So online retail and and indeed the facility to go to your local cinema and watch the New York Met broadcast live in high definition, which, to be honest, is better than going to the Metropolitan Opera House because the Metropolitan Opera House tends to frown on popcorn and large vats of, of Diet Coke. Right. <laughs> OK. Um, you know, your the, 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 the what, what I used to call the provincial deficit is lower than it's ever been, in a sense that the extent to which you are missing out by not being in a huge city um, has been massively reduced by uh, technology. And actually, no, this is the strangest thing of all, I agree with you, which is that... Um, now, it is interesting that when people get older, they kind of want to move out, and it's probably because the role that opportunity plays, it, um, it for evolutionary reasons, diminishes with age. Because, in other words, my life outcome is much, much narrower as a funnel at the age of 53. I'm not going to score a winning goal for England in a soccer match, OK? Patently, I never was, frankly, going to be. But at 18 or 16 or 15, you could dream of that outcome, OK? You know, and secondly, I suppose there's the other point, which is I have less life remaining in order to gain from experimentation. <laughs> Being brutal about it, OK? So when you're, when you're 15, you have a huge amount of future to gain from... Uh, what you might call positive upside. Um, and also, of course, as I said, um, your the possible variance of your life outcome is much, much greater at that point than it is when you've got a bunch of sunk costs in terms of where you've worked, where your experience lies and so on. And so that that quest for basically, as you as I would say, you know, opportunity stroke fame, um, that's what's driving um, that's what's really driving urbanization to an insane degree. But I would agree with you that St. Louis, to me, would be a great trade-off between the two because it's pretty good. You know, you, you've got enough branches of Whole Foods, you know, yeah. right? Well, when you think about, uh, like, you know, do you want restaurant options? It's like St. Louis is probably, I don't know, maybe a quarter of the size of New York, maybe half, whatever. It's still got more places to eat than you'll ever eat in your lifetime. <laughs> but, like, for some reason, <laughs> no, like, I, even more, we need more choices. Like, I need to make sure it's the best place ever every time, you know. I don't know. And actually, one of the annoying things with New York, of course, is that um, uh, uh, you also have that insane restaurant fashion thing, which is I went to an extraordinary good restaurant and somebody commented, that's so last year. And I kind of went... I think whether the food's good, not on whether yeah. it's difficult to get in. You know, yeah. I, you know, my perfect restaurant is a really good restaurant where it's really easy to get the table. Let's be well, honest. and then that's, again, there's uh, other motivations. There's like status. Yeah. It's like yeah, I no, am the status. No, absolutely. Like, I'm the yeah. food person. I'm telling you, that's not cool anymore. Uh, yeah, but well, it tells you more about the person who's making the comment, really, of like what they it does, yeah. value. And how unsophisticated I mean, also, I may also, be. I think, by the way, your urge for having uh, restaurant variety, the older you get, the more conservative you become, both politically and in other ways. Because, as I said, first of all, uh, habit becomes a bigger driver of your behavior when you become older. Uh, I don't want anybody to interpret from that that you become less creative. I'm merely saying that you have more experience to draw on. So you know what you like to a greater extent. You almost rely on your intuition heavier. So you can, you, you've got more Bayesian kind of restaurant information yeah. on which to draw. Secondly, as I said, you have fewer years to benefit from experimental discoveries. So it makes sense that the what you might call habit, uh, habit and social copying perhaps become, uh, you know, those heuristics, those kind of satisfying heuristics play a greater part in your life as you get older. When you get older, basically, I've done my spawning. I've got two twin. I've got twin daughters. Okay, that's basically the extent of my gene pool for my lifetime. Uh, okay, so the effort you job. effort you put into signalling bullshit uh, also probably diminishes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because, you know, basically that, you know, the Sutherland gene pool is now at its maximum extent. I'm not planning to extend <laughs> it any further. Gain. Any, yeah. <laughs> any more gain any more gain is purely for selfish ego reasons mm. at that point mm. yeah and some people are driven more by that than others um no true but uh so we're i know we're we're coming close on our time here the time is flying by i did want to kind of like turn around and think you know sort of to our last question a little bit like it's kind of established in how you go in depth in the book in which i recommend everybody listening reads um 
so we rely to way too much on logic, you know, increasingly we think algorithms are the solution to all these things, when really it's all these inefficiencies and all these different reasons for things working or different motivations of people that really provide a lot of value. So like in your thought, like if someone is working within a company or they're running a company or any type of organization, really, it could be, you know, a, um, a government agency that they're working in or something like that. How do you think people can start flipping that to think less along valuing only logical <laughs> solutions well, and start to I implement we, and try out these different like psychological, as you call them? I think there are a couple of things, one of which is the burden of proof we demand of logical sounding suggestions is inordinately lower than the burden of proof we demand before we'll believe anything counterintuitive. And as a result, my argument against economics and our comfortable belief in economics is that it comes, using economic language ironically, at a huge creative opportunity cost, which is, you know, if you think about it, if you had a product that wasn't selling and you said, let's drop the price, that might be a three minute board conversation. Literally, nodded through. Okay, we know that price demand curve slopes only one way. It doesn't, okay? So we're just going to drop the price. If you said, let's try putting the price up, you'd have to justify yourself with a whole deck of research and experimentation. And the, uh, as I said, the burden of proof demanded of you in implementing anything that runs counter to standard economic theory almost makes it so effortful that nobody can be bothered. Even though, the second thing is that the mechanistic view that economics has tends people to think that the scale of the intervention is proportionate to the scale of the effect and therefore nobody looks for butterfly effects nobody ever says well you've got this problem have you thought of putting the price up and putting it in the cardboard box this was a fast food example because we automatically think of fast food items if they're in a cardboard box they're posher than if they're just wrapped in paper right okay so nobody looks for butterfly effects which is a tragedy. That's why the book's called Alchemy, because in physics, there's no such thing as magic. That's why it's that kind of science, okay? Economics, by trying to borrow from physics, has created a world where nothing can be created or destroyed. There's no magic, right? You can't create something out of nothing. Now, if you think about it, Milton Friedman's There's No Such Thing as a Free Lunch is an economist's attempt to replicate Newton's second law of thermodynamics, where you say energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can just take a different form. And my view is, in psychology, you can magic shit out of nowhere. Tell a different story about something, and you can make a brilliant thing terrible or a terrible thing brilliant. And you, by changing what people pay attention to, you can entirely turn a weakness into a strength. And the, the example I, I wish I'd given in the book, which I was too late with, is we're number two, so we try harder. OK, Cialdini makes this wonderful point that um, quite a lot of great advertising end lines uh, have a, a kind of inherent contradiction. You know, um, uh, good things come to those who wait, uh, reassuringly expensive. Now, the great one, the great thing about we're number two. Now, think about that. 1960. OK, that, that was Hertz. Back. Was that Hertz? Or... That, that was Avis. It, yes, the great thing was, is yeah. now. In 1960, being number two in America basically meant you weren't as good as the number one. You know, there weren't hipster car renters around in the 1960s. You go, no, I actually rent my cars for a really obscure place you won't have heard of, right? Okay. <laughs> Sounds um, like a business uh, opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, there's a market opportunity there, isn't yeah. there? Hipster car rental. But, but I, I love hipsters, by the way. I think they're actually an essential part of the market ecosystem. We should actually subsidize them. Because the value yeah. they perform in essentially bringing different heuristics and different values to markets helps diversify markets. I mean, I really, you know, actually the quest for a perfect avocado sandwich is a perfectly worthy use of uh, human genius. OK, now, anyway, parking that. Um, so we're number two. So we try hard. Now, we're number two basically said we're not as good as Hertz, you know. It's a weakness. Why would you admit to the fact that we have fewer locations than Hertz, that we haven't, you know, we, we don't have the scale of Hertz? And then you chuck in these four words, so we try harder. And you suddenly turned a boring fact, which is negative, into a story, which is positive. We're not complacent. And that, like, that's yeah. alchemy. That's, that is genuine magic where you're creating economic value. Now, an economist would say, sorry, that's impossible. You can't create economic value that way, uh, except an Austrian economist. The Austrian school will write about this as about everything else, uh, in my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm more and more warmed to those guys. Um, but um, th that genuinely, if you're trying to make something scientific and the 
price you pay for appearing to be scientific is you deny the existence of magic, then you're actually destroying value, potential value, in your quest to make everything make sense and in your quest to present a spreadsheet to the board that, they, that won't disturb them. And a prior conversation, you're making people less happy because, like the oh, beer, like the beer example, like happy. micro, yeah, my, the microbrewery culture is very inefficient, but it makes us happier and it gives us more choices. You know? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I completely agree. And so, you know, the the micro beer thing is a classic case. Uh, an example of inefficiency, by the way, which is an interesting one, which is the biggest obstacle to air travel probably for many people isn't economic. It's now the fact that airports are a royal pain in the ass. By the way, there's probably another reason to move to St. Louis, because I bet you've got a really great airport, have you? Top notch. Exactly. You see, right? Okay. You know, I, I, basically, I bet St. Louis Airport, I've never been there. I will love to go there. I bet it shits on JFK and Newark and all those places, right? Now, okay, I, 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 just as I predicted, you know, my favorite airports are small American airports, you know, Albuquerque, you know. Uh, there's one in Santa Barbara, which is like a 19, it's like a 1940s gem. You know, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Ja- ja- Jackson, Jackson, Wyoming is my favorite one. Oh, yeah. I, I, that, I dream. That's on my bucket list as well. Oh, that, the the, the that, airport should be on your bucket list. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> now, it suddenly occurred to me, we love small airports, right? And why we love small airports is because the anxious period between the first hurdle we've got to clear, which is effectively checking in our luggage, then we've got to go to security, then we possibly go to a lounge, then we go to a gate, then we clear the gate, then we board the plane. In a small airport, those are concertina down into a manageable duration and distance. You know, it's a walk of about 150 yards, maybe 200 yards, and it's a relatively short time. So you spend a short time feeling anxious. There is no reason why you couldn't make a huge airport just like six small airports side by side. So you go, actually, I'm flying with Americans, so I'm going to this end of the airport. And you could go in, check in your your luggage, go through security, get to the plane. It'd be just as easy as London City Airport or Albuquerque Sunport. I think it is. Nice one. It's great. Anything in New Mexico is great. Have you been there? It's fucking fantastic. I mean, genuinely. It's towards the top of my list. I have not been yet, though. Oh, no, no. no. Santa Fe Opera. Go to that. Wonderful. Open. Well, it's not open. It's an open-sided opera house where you basically listen to opera to the sound of cicada. Uh, utterly fabulous. Anyway, but you could make a big airport that was like small airports side by side. Why didn't they do that? And it only occurred to me two days ago. It's efficiency, which is they want to gain the efficiency gains of consolidating immigration, consolidating security, consolidating the duty-free shop, consolidating kind of passport control, right? And the need to consolidate those things for efficiency means that the passenger now has to walk for half a mile, Okay. So the passenger suffers for a form of efficiency, which, to be honest, they'd pay to fucking avoid. I'd pay a £30 premium not to go through that shit every time I had to fly. But because you're optimizing it for efficiency, you know, a really large airport is basically the Anheuser-Busch of air travel, right? It's efficiency at war with human preference. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so it assumes, as economics assumes, that the way you make something better is you reduce the price of it. And it's that need to consolidate and enjoy economies of scale in terms of security control, the X-ray place, you know, all those things, which essentially um, creates the total pain that is the modern large airport. Now, Interestingly, there's another price which never gets factored in, which is fragility, which is if one of those things goes goes down, you've got a major sodding disaster on your hands. <laughs> OK, right. Because there's, there's no you slack suddenly in the have system. thousands yeah. of passengers basically backed up because something's gone wrong with your bloody passport control system or these people are on strike or whatever. Whereas if you have nine micro airports all side by side, the passenger would happily pay a premium for the reduction in pain. And if something went wrong, it would only affect one ninth of the airport at a time rather than screwing up the whole damn thing. And so it's a really interesting point, which is that the the gains from efficiency and scale are often salient and quantifiable, and the losses are often psychological, non-quantifiable, and therefore invisible. Well, I'll tell you, I was flying out of the St. Louis airport uh, two weeks ago, and a meeting had run late, and so I was getting there. I arrived at the airport right when I was supposed to be boarding for my flight, 
walked in, walked straight through security, pre-check, walked straight to the gate, and I walked up right as they were calling my uh, number to board. And so, uh, yeah, it was like a you love it, no. better if I tried. Do, do you also get at St. Louis, which you get at Phoenix, those volunteers who are retired people who volunteer just to help passengers by being friendly? Oh, that's wonderful. No, I, the, I, I thought you were. No, the that most, sounds amazing. That, that's <laughs> basically my retirement plan is to become a voluntary helper at Phoenix Airport. But <laughs> they, they're, 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 they're literally retired people who, for whatever reason, like airports. Yeah, paid And they basically go around and they're just they're just there to be helpful now. To be honest, I mean, in terms of improving the passenger experience, you could be paying them like $90,000 a year, and they'd right. kind of be worth it. Because having a really nice, particularly experienced human being who says, to be absolutely honest, if you want to eat, I'd go over there, Yeah, right, is just utterly wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's like having greeters at, uh, uh, like, grocery stores, like, uh, we'll have greeters, or like, you know, yeah. or like a Costco, for example. I think Costco is a good example of a lot of this, where they go against almost all of the efficiencies in a lot of ways, or against the traditional, where it's like they pay their people a lot more than a traditional grocery worker, but those people are very nice and super helpful. So the experience is actually enjoyable. Even though you walk in there and it's like this enormous, intimidating warehouse, it somehow is an enjoyable experience, you know? So I'll I'll give you a classic example of this, which is that um, uh, most of the 1990s, and early 2000s in the UK was spent offshoring call center jobs. What's now happening is most of them are being brought back onshore. And if you think about it, if there's one place, if you're, a, let's say, a utility, like a phone company or an energy company, okay, if there's one place where it is really dumb to seek um, cost savings, it's in those rare moments where a customer actually cares enough about you to ring you up. OK, it's rather like having a hotel where you spend a fortune on the rooms and you make everything perfect. But reception basically just directs you to go to a hotel three, you know, 300 yards down the street where the, where someone might be able to help you out. It is so insane in terms of and actually there's a whole area which in a separate podcast I'd be happy to discuss, which is the idea of ergodicity. Or, or rather the assumption that once you model something as if it's a mechanistic you know, uh, as I said, physical device, you tend to assume that one times 10 is the same as 10 times one. Okay, because when you put things on a spreadsheet, you tend to multiply them or add them up. And when you aggregate them, you lose the distinction between one person buying 10 things and 10 people buying one thing. And that aggregated data is actually highly misleading because the if you think about it, Airport, the, the huge airport, the retail thing, is really optimized to the person who doesn't fly very often. Because they go, well, actually, I'm on holiday. It's a really special occasion. Ooh, um, there's a branch of Louis I'm Vuitton. I'm in no rush, right? whatever. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm in no rush. Hey, it's four hours until our flight to so-and-so leaves. Let's get some bloody Ooh, Let's go and buy and a Louis out, Vuitton yeah. hat, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, if you fly 15 times a year, right, okay, you do not go, ooh, wow, there's a branch of Louis Vuitton. You go fucking hell, there's another branch of Louis Vuitton. What I really want is, you know, a packet of aspirin and a bottle of water. And I can't find anybody to sell those low margin devices because the entire airport is given over to basically sort of Veblen goods. And that's, that's the, so that, that, um, that failure to understand. I mean, if you think about Amazon Prime, it interests me because uh, the point about Amazon Prime is that very simply, 10 people, don't mind paying three pounds for delivery once a month, but one person won't pay three pounds ten times a month. Mm-hmm. And it's a really interesting question, which is that um, things don't really work. Uh, if you look at things in one dimension, uh, one of the mistakes I think we've made uh, is we've looked at economic inequality by a series of snapshots. But, of course, what matters with economic inequality is the extent to which people move from one decile to another. Because that's mobility. How you mobile know, you, are they between you exp- areas, you know, yeah. I mean, let's face it, okay, a lot, one of the reasons why there are more poor people around nowadays is that there are more students, okay? Mm-hmm. But you don't think of a Yale law student as being poor, even though, objectively, he owns very little, because his future earning potential is enormous, okay? So... It's very, very easy to get completely misleading views of the world by not factoring in time adequately. 
And because it's harder to track data over time, and obviously the results take much longer to emerge, we're disproportionately using these kind of snapshot things as a way of trying to understand the world. And it's dangerously misleading. I mean, potentially you can actually have a country which is getting poorer overall, where everybody in it is getting richer over the course of their life. Now, that's probably happier than a country that's getting richer overall, but everybody's getting poorer in the course of their life. Yeah, I thought about this a lot. Uh, I think I tweeted about this recently, actually, in that, like, the wrong metric thing you could look at, the way we design economies is wrong. So we look at, like, is GDP hmm. going up? Like, if GDP is going up, then we're good. But GDP could be going up for a really small slice of people, or it could be going up overall, but at the same time... So, like, uh, you know, something came up, I was thinking about while we were talking on a topic earlier, is that, like, you know, right now... By uh, numbers wise, the economy is really good, but it doesn't necessarily feel good for a lot of people because no. housing, because the things that they need are still really expensive and unaffordable. So like someone might live in New York, for example, and have a great job that they wouldn't otherwise have a very stable job, but they can never afford to buy a house. Um, they have a ton of student loan debt. And even though by all these objective measures, things are good, it doesn't feel good to people in the same way. So like, there's more I, 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 measures. And I think this goes a lot of the theme of what we're talking about in that products and everything in general have a lot more reasons there's a lot more ways to measure effectiveness than just the economic one and that does the product do a service and does it also make us feel good you know i mean there's a really interesting there's a really interesting question i always ask about america a few questions because i'm a huge americanophile so i don't want sure you to interpret this as, uh, as criticism okay uh, but i'm a massive americanophile but there are a few things one i think you might be richer if you took more vacation I would 100%. Now, there is no economic model, really, to actually explain that. One, I would argue that the money people spend when they're at leisure creates more labour-intensive employment than the money they spend when they're busy, mm -hmm. uh, in many cases. Uh, okay. Secondly, I think people are better when they're rested. Thirdly, I think that one, f one thing I'd criticise the US from is that it generates a disproportionate number of the, of the world's good ideas. No one's disputing that for a second. But it's very bad at stealing good ideas from anywhere else. Hmm. So nobody ever, you know, if Americans had a bit more time to go and say, actually, mass urban tr transport doesn't have to be terrible by spending a week in Barcelona. Now, no I'm not suggesting for a second. Now, when, now, if I say that, people say, are you saying that Barcelona is better than America? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that by the law of averages, some other countries are going to luck into good ideas which you don't originate. You know, let's, let's be honest. You know, uh, you know, I always joke about this, very politically incorrect, but I always say the exchange uh, between Britain and India of cricket for curry was the most valuable cultural exchange in history. You know, we got really interesting food, which we never had. They yeah. got a really fantastic sport, which they're better at than us most of the time. Okay. <laughs> Everyone know, wins. Those kind yeah. of things, those kind of exchanges, everybody wins, right? I always recommend that anybody standing for the US presidency should just go in and say, four weeks paid in vacation, see what happens. Hey there, action designers. A quick word from your producer, Zach Simon here. This concludes part one of our interview with Rory Sutherland. Rory was so generous with his time when we recorded this conversation that we actually have enough for a two-part episode. So be sure to tune in later this month for part two. Until then, keep an eye out for new articles on our website's blog section, and be sure to check out your local action design chapters for the last meetup events of 2019. Happy holidays, action designers. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other platforms where you might typically get your pod on. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness about behavioral economics, psychology, and all things behavioral science in order to help you improve your life, your career, and your understanding of the world around us and the people in it. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. 
Once again, that's action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States and Canada. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.